Hey guys, I'm in a really magical place right now. I'm in Wellington, New Zealand at the incredible Weta Workshop uh, who contributed amazing concept designs and props and models uh, and constructions for the eagerly anticipated Ghost in the Shell and we are privileged enough to actually be able to see them in person and talk about them. Richard Taylor uh, is here to tell us. Adam, great to have you in our workshop again. Oh, I just, I love being here. Every time I come is an adventure and this is blowing my mind how, <laughs> how magnificent these are. Tell me what, the, what, the, what, what your original charge was to, to make here. Well, getting to work on Ghost in the Shell, as you can imagine, a seminal movie in all of our movie watching history, but yes. also an extraordinary opportunity to bring to life physically. Rupert, the director, wanted to do as much as possible physically. So big thumbs up That's right awesome. there. Perfect. And yes. uh, these would have easily been uh, tackled digitally, but he wanted physical geishas for the scenes where the geishas have been hacked. Uh, they uh, they transform into these uh, bizarre, uh, deadly cyborg-like creatures. And in and this case, we wanted to do them very much as um, as costume characters that were worn by very elegant, beautiful dancers. And and normally, you were saying uh, earlier off camera that they, the original idea was maybe to do these, do these as prosthetics, but you decided to do them as masks. Yeah, that's right. There was a lot of ideas thrown around. We did tests where we just did straight makeup on people. The problem there is that uh, their own pore structure, the imperfections in the human face, doesn't let that extraordinary elegance of the the sort of the quintessential geisha come through. We tried prosthetics. We ultimately uh, campaigned very hard to do them as porcelain dolls, literally so they would feel like they were made out of hard materials. And that's indeed ultimately how we ended up doing them. And when you're making masks for people, how, is, how did you work out getting hard masks on soft people? That's not always a simple problem. Well, the first thing we did is uh, Rupert chose one actor, a young uh, Japanese actress called Rila, a very famous actress, and she already had an extraordinary face. We scanned her, head cast her, and then we made her digitally symmetrical. Then we had to fit every other actor's head inside Rila's head. Very tricky, <laughs> as you can imagine, because we have access primarily to European featured people, yeah. larger noses, broader bridges to their nose, etc., etc. But fiddling around, we got their heads to perfectly fit and uh, were able to make them comfy. If, in fact, if we open up this one, you'll have to help me a little All bit. Right. But uh, if we hold it up, and so it's simply got the sort of thing that you have on a ski jacket that hides away inside here. Wow. And you loosen that, and that oh. slides apart, and off it comes. <laughs> and that's the inside of the mask. It's very important when doing things like this that you can dress the actors quickly because the frustration for the actors of being stuck inside these things. So if you're doing a mask, you want to be able to get it on and off really, yeah. really fast. These cables up here are to go to batteries that drive... Um, uh, squirrel fans that ah. are inside the head. So they have a little so bit they've of got, cooling Well, they've actually got quite a lot of air sucking through their nostrils and over their faces. A nightmare for the poor sound guys, of course, because you've course. got these things whizzing away. And uh, they're actually expelling through these very nicely hidden slots here in the so hair. you've incorporated the design of comfort all the way into the aesthetics. Yes, very trying to be very thoughtful of that sort of thing. The foam pads you can see in there are specifically to hold uh, pressure points. We try and pick up on these specific pressure points on the face. These are where the hard bone areas are. If yeah. you pick up here, the, the mask will slide and slip around on the flesh. But if huh. you pick up on the hard points, I call it the washing line of the human face. These <laughs> are where the pegs are on the washing line it will hang on to the face very, very well. This is the kind of institutional knowledge that Weta has from decades of... A lot, lot of mucking around with this yeah. sort of stuff. The eyes, interestingly, are done very similar to sunglasses, so mm -hmm. that uh, when you have no light behind them, you can't see through them at all. But uh, should uh, you look through them, you've got pretty good vision. Yeah. A big problem is lack of peripheral vision. A bi real big challenge with puppets is that the moment you put a puppet head on, and you take the peripheral vision from what our human eye has to a pinpoint out here, it's you claustrophobic. and you lose your balance, of yeah. course, because we, we use our peripheral for balance. So right. um, The paint job is really magnificent. 
Um, did, did you sculpt these? We milled them and then did a huge amount of model making on them to get them as perfect as they are. Oh, so they were 3D printed? 3D printed and milled. Inserting, oh, okay. we post put in the pins. These mm -hmm. are actually just standard dressmakers pin heads, but we wanted to get the quality of domed surface that you couldn't have got in a 3D print or a mill. I myself spent hours on them as the number of members of our staff trying to get them as perfect as we possibly could. All the hair is 3D printed initially. We take moulds and then take castings. Uh, in the case of one that's been blown up, of course, there's a huge amount of scratch build model making into them. It's really intricate and beautiful and uh, kind of super intense to see it up close, to see such a beautiful thing uh, so destroyed. These are, these are the things that go into the back of the donor's necks. These have got horrible pins that come out and skewer into the docking points and these are tendrils that come out of the throat. As you'll see here with this full body, even though they are future tech, this yeah. is a world in our future, we don't want to always um, play to what is expected in the form of a hard tech, uh, uh, manufactured, engineered world. And as you can see here, many, many people watching this will remember a movie such as Hugo, mm -hmm. which celebrates in the automata of the 17th and 18th century. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to find here is, is a technological mix between handcrafted, beautiful, skill-based work. Um, you know, maybe the Asian eye maker in Blade Runner is a great example of that. I, you know, I only yeah, do Chu. eyes, but yeah, Chu, he yeah. has this extraordinary ability to weave his craft into the objects he makes. And we're trying to find that in turn. How much fun to work with such aesthetic richness as, uh, if, I mean, from the model making, casting, molding, design standpoint, there's, there's so much to sink your teeth into. To, to have a client that is willing to let you go to these places that isn't just thinking at a single plane of ideas which are well it's future tech therefore it must be like a modern day cell phone right. it's lovely to have someone that's willing to take these sorts of creative ideas and run with them uh, which is very nice i've even seen some incredible details like in molded designs in these clear uh, clear resin hair, hair Hair yeah, the hair pieces. I, I really, in the case of these, I, I didn't want them just to be loose site blocks. I wanted that we saw a form of ancient uh, uh, Japanese wood carving within them, for instance. Uh, but when the light hits these, they ping beautifully. And so these are all lucite components cast into it. Now, and while these are static props, um, you actually contributed some animatronics, and this is an example of some of your animatronics. Um, yeah, our, our, our animatronics department did a great deal of work on this movie, and uh, in the case of this, as you oh! can see, so uh, dude, so <laughs> the uh, it she uh, she opens and closes, and and out of the mouthpiece here is where the tendril feeds. That is terrifying. If you come in closely, you can see that it's completely clockwork. It's oh, all working. Gears that are actually spinning in there. It and, is uh, so gorgeous. Yeah, so this really captures that quality of the hand skill uh, automata clockmaker yeah. of the 17th century. But then with, you know, how do you move the facial muscles? Then it's got this um, very electronic uh, motif in it as well. Well, so I know as uh, having worked with the animatronics that this requires the coordination and collaboration of artists and engineers and craftspeople working together, there's a tremendous amount of coordination going yeah, on. Yeah, there is. To bring something like this together and bring it together really quickly, uh, because you, know, we, we, you can almost describe it as shooting from the hip. There's yeah. no chance to aim and fire. It, it's almost like a gunslinger because, and the only way that works is if you're intuitively connected right. because you've done it so many times together before. And uh, one thing has to flow into another, into another. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't go wrong, of course. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when you're jerry-rigging something like this, as, as you, you, know, you do in your own work, there's no plan. No one wrote a manual to do it. <laughs> no. uh, you've never done exactly this before. So you've got to jerry-rig it to some degree. And that just requires almost guerrilla model making. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's some nice little ideas, like uh, these panels are held on by magnets. So oh. that if the uh, thing gets knocked, they don't smash the mechanism. That's the, really cool. uh, These will just detach, and then oh. we can simply clip them back on. 
That also makes working on them and model making Correct, them exactly. much simpler. Correct, so, uh, exactly. And they self-home and go exactly back into place. Oh, that's amazing. And of course, when they close, they've got to marry back up exactly together. This may not look like a great deal of uh, complexity to your viewers, seeing the immense complexity in things like an automotive car, but trying to get those petals to exactly match together in perfect timing, whew, No, I, I look, very every tricky. Car, every car door is a masterpiece of yes, engineering. Yes, it is, absolutely. A, a car door is a surprisingly complex thing to make and to get the hinges to work and hang and not misadjust during, you know, uh, operation and that's exactly the challenge here. One of the things I love about visiting here Richard is how much you guys uh, embrace both the entire history of film using some of the oldest techniques imaginable and yet marrying those to some of the newest technologies. You're always building your own 3D printers and 3D yeah. routers using latest technologies for scanning and digital interfaces and the results are just gobsmacking in person. Oh, thank you. It's interesting, you know, the camera that's been filmed, that's filming us today, it only exists because it's climbed on the shoulders yeah. of cameras before it over 100 plus years. And, and here, what we're trying to do is iterate on top of the technology that we were using yesterday to do something unique tomorrow. No audience wants to see tomorrow what they saw yesterday. Yeah. So a movie like this, we would have struggled to make this movie in the time we had to make it two years ago because neither was the technology around nor was the chemistry within the technology around. Uh, the skeleton that we built, which I hope to show you, uh, the materials weren't even in existence two years ago, so wow. we couldn't have built it. Right. But we can build it today because technology is iterating and growing just like the camera might be. And because you guys are paying attention to that technology and incorporating it into, your, into the model. You have to have this unabashed enthusiasm for data sheets, basically. <laughs> uh, you know, choice of reading a novel or a data sheet, it's going to be a data sheet because that's where you learn this stuff. That's where you discover the amazing things people are doing all over the world. How big was the team that uh, Weta had on Ghost in the Shell? Oh, I think at its height, probably about 120, 150 people. That is uh, we had a big on-set presence, uh, complementing the amazing makeup department and uh, uh, a team just looking after practical effects. But most of it was in the build back here in the workshop. Right, because when you build something like this, it's not you don't just build it and send it to the set. You have to support it. You have Absolutely, to be able to rig do. it, fix yeah. it, change it. Uh, you know, on average, we do six to seven movies a year. Only one of those may be in New Zealand. So that means we've got to have crews on the road somewhere in the world looking after the stuff. And you can't just turn back to the workshop if it breaks. You've got to know it's not going to break. And right. you've got to go well equipped if it does go wrong. Oh. So it requires a very unique type of human to go out on set and look after the stuff. Richard, thank you so much for showing these beautiful objects. I hope someday uh, there will be a, an exhibition of these where people can come see it in person. I it's really, really hope. I'm here to tell you, no matter what you're seeing on this camera, I'm just going to get some beautiful close-ups that you've probably already seen during this interview. In person, it looks twice as good. Thank you cool. so much, Thank sir. you very much. Cheers to you all. We'll put her back to sleep, eh?